If you're a regular Geek's Guide to the Galaxy listener, please rate and review us on iTunes or using the podcast app on your phone. We currently have 938 five-star ratings, and it would be great to get that up to 1,000. And I want to give a special thank you to Hayam K, who recently wrote us this five-star review. One-stop shopping for geeks and nerds like me. Never miss an episode, not only for sci-fi fans. Content from all areas of intellectual exploration. Loved the episode with Brian Keating. So big thanks again to Hayam K for that great review. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 452 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the recent anthology, The Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy 2020, edited by John Joseph Adams and Diana Gabaldon. And we've discussed previous books in this series back in episodes 177, 224, and 342. So definitely check those out if you miss them. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got our producer, John Joseph Adams. He's the editor of Lightspeed Magazine and the series editor of The Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy. And he's also edited more than 30 other anthologies. His latest project is the three-volume Dystopia Triptych, Ignorance is Strength, Burn the Ashes, and Or Else the Light. So, John, welcome back. Always good to be here. The next up, we've got Tobias S. Piquel, making his 13th appearance on the show. He's the author of the Xenowealth series of space adventure novels, the eco-thrillers Arctic Rising and Hurricane Fever, and the Halo novels The Cold Protocol and Envoy. His short story, The Galactic Tourist Industrial Complex, appears in the Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy 2020. So, Toby, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me again. Lucky 13. Woo! <laughs> and also joining us today is Elizabeth Bear. She's the author of 30 novels and over 100 short stories, and her work has received the Hugo, Sturgeon, Locus, and Campbell Awards. Her most recent novel, Machine, is a science fiction adventure set in a hospital in deep space. Her stories, Bullet Point and Erase, 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 appear in the Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy 2020. So, Bear, welcome to the show. I feel like I've gotten to sit at the cool kids' table. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to start off with a little announcement. If you enjoyed our episode with our, my interview with Brian Keating back in episode 445, he just interviewed me for his Into the Impossible podcast. Uh, so everyone go check that out. It's a cool 90-minute interview, and it's my first ever on-camera interview. So Ooh. if you ever wanted to know what I look like, you can go check that out. It was funny, just before we uh, recorded, uh, Bear was saying, wait, is this going to be audio or video? <laughs> and I said, no, no, it's it's audio only. And she said, oh, I, uh, I took a shower for nothing. <laughs> I, don't know if, I, don't know if was, <laughs> I don't know if that was a joke or not. Um, I, I would have taken a shower anyway. <laughs> I, I imagine I imagine your, Scott, your, your husband, Scott, uh, appreciates oh, that. You yes, yes. The, the, it, is, it is a kindness to one's quarantine cohabitants to maintain certain minimum standards of cleanliness. <laughs> hmm. But so when, when Brian interviewed me, you know, he wanted to do it as a video live stream. And so I was like, Oh my God, you know, and he asked me like, Oh, why don't you do video? And I'm like, oh, cause I don't want people looking at me. <laughs> and I also like, um, you know, I really like having a week to go over everything I said 50 times and make sure I want it out on the internet for all time. <laughs> so, uh, um, but yeah, if you want to see me, uh, unedited, you know, what, like unplugged, uh, you could go check out that live stream. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, Dr. Brian Keating on YouTube. Uh, so check that out. Well, if doing 452 episodes of a podcast doesn't make you all polished up and ready to go for a live show, then I don't know what does. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's a good point. Um, but so I was just actually noticing that John and Toby haven't been, it's been almost a year since you guys were mm. on the show, which kind of surprised me when I looked at that. Um, kind of just letting you down. It's been <laughs> kind of an kind of an uneventful year and everything. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I was just curious because John, you have actually fled California, so I'm sure yes. all the all the John Joseph Adams fans are probably curious to hear where you are now. Uh, yeah, we're in uh, Columbia, Missouri now. Um, yeah, just uh, you know, my stepdaughter uh, Grace had turned 18 and she graduated high school, and so uh, once she did that and uh, was going off on her own, uh, that freed us up to be able to move somewhere else. Um, also, uh, I don't want to get into the whole story, but uh, uh, 
it, it's perhaps intriguing to note that uh, there was an attempted cat abduction that involved that that factored into our move, uh, and as as a result, afterward we wanted to move away from that place, uh, and so uh, we had some friends here. And this uh, is wait wait decided... wait wait wait. <laughs> so John, so so someone tried to abduct one of your cats, or you tried <laughs> to abduct someone else's cats. <laughs> Uh, the first one, uh, somebody tried to abduct <laughs> our cat. Uh, yeah. And, and there was, uh, shouting at us in the street and all manner of fun things. So, uh, yeah. So we didn't want to live there anymore. And, uh, we moved uh, to Columbia where, uh, we had some friends and also, Hey, by the way, uh, housing prices are way better <laughs> here. <laughs> so, so far so less cat stealing. Well, so far, yeah, look, there's been absolutely no cat stealing. Although that we also don't let the cats go outside anymore. So, okay. I hope the people who bought your house don't have cats. <laughs> yeah, we should have. <laughs> Not his problem anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, you know, uh, my girlfriend, Steph, and I moved to Austin, you know, about a year ago. And because of the whole pandemic, we haven't really like gotten to do anything the whole time we've lived here. So I'm mm -hmm. imagining, is it something similar for you, John? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know anything about anything in in the city yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> our our local friend did drive us around, and and so we got to see some some of it. And she's like lived here a long time, so she knows her way around very well. Um, but uh, but yeah, yeah, we just we haven't been able to do anything. We just like we're we're sort of seeing all the places that we could go eventually someday. Uh, but <laughs> mostly just yeah, hanging out in the you're, house. How you're surviving without any uh, live Dungeons and Dragons games to go to? <laughs> oh, oh! I've got plenty of I've got plenty of uh, online ones though, Dave. Uh, I've got so many D and D games happening. Uh, it's it, it. I'm perfectly fine with it. I I actually don't miss live D and D at all. I uh, uh, having having gotten into playing on Roll Twenty and, and Fantasy Grounds and such, uh, you know, online. It's it, it fulfills my every desire. My Pathfinder game moved to Discord, um, and uh, back in March of last year for reasons that will be obvious, and I have to say i really enjoy it it's mm -hmm. it, it's nice not to have to drive two hours in you know new england weather yeah. yeah yeah and for all the hardcore john fans out there we are planning <laughs> to do some sort of dungeons and dragons episode coming up so uh you know, mm -hmm. keep, keep your ears peeled for that one Hey, and you know, speaking of me not being on the show very much, uh, the good news about HMH uh, discontinuing my novel imprint is that I have more free time now, so uh, I can just come on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wasn't going to bring it up, but yeah, um, yeah. since you brought it up, yeah, I guess. Right. <laughs> is there anything more to say about, say about that? Uh, not really. I mean, you know, just since you were you know, sort of talking about like news for John fans or whatever. It's like, well, yeah. it's, it's kind of relevant. Uh, but no, I mean, you know, it's just one of those things that happens. I'm sure the pandemic didn't help with that. Um, I, I, I kind of feel like the plug got pulled a little bit early, but, um, but the good news about uh, the other good thing besides me getting to peer and geese guide more is that best American is not, you know, tied up in that. Uh, so that's continuing at least for, I think we just have it renewed for one more volume and then we would have to renew it again after that. So, you know, there's the 2021 volume that I'm working on now, and then there's going to be a 2022 volume. And then after that, we'll, we'll have to, you know, recon recontract it or, you know, re up the contract. So, um, yeah, it's unaffected by that news, which I know I, I had to, <laughs> I had to assure many people. I also had to weirdly assure people that uh, my magazines don't have anything to do with it, that my other anthologies don't have anything to do with it. I mean, I guess people just don't know how publishing works, but uh, which is fine. It's a, it's a weird mystery that uh, really no one should try to understand. Uh, <laughs> I don't advise it, but. Yeah, there are those of us who work in it, who've been working in it for a long time, we still don't understand it. <laughs> yeah. Have you announced, John, who the guest editors are going to be for the upcoming volumes? That's a good question that I should have probably gotten an official answer to before this episode. Uh, unfortunately, I know who it is, and I think you can actually find the answer online, but I don't know if I've actually been greenlit to actually officially say who it is. Um, just because one of the stupid things about publishing is that, you know, they release these feeds out into... Uh, all the different sellers in the world and like Amazon, for instance. And so, um, you know, Amazon gets and these other sellers, they get all these all this news that is 
technically available online, but maybe sometimes people haven't announced it yet. So like this happens a lot with like covers. Uh, so it's like the covers on Amazon and, and the authors are panicking. They're like the covers on Amazon, but we haven't announced it yet. We haven't shared it yet. Are, aren't we going to, aren't we going to do a cover reveal? And um, so it's one of those things where it's like, I know it's out there, but no one's actually said that it's okay to say who it is. So. All right. Well, Sorry. we'll just, uh, people can just Google it when they listen yeah. to this. <laughs> Yeah, it's always fun, like on the author's side where you, uh, you know, you, you see the cover appear on Amazon, which everyone can get to and everyone sees and you put a link to it. And then someone from the publisher like yells at you and they're like, right. why did you why did you leak the cover? <laughs> and you're like, it's on, it's right. I got it off of Amazon. I thought it was common knowledge. I didn't yeah, <laughs> right. You know what? You know what? I don't care. No one told me I couldn't say who it is, and it's out there. It's on the internet. I have I have a perfectly good reason for saying the answer because why should I make Geek's Guide listeners go Google some stupid shit? Here we go. Uh, We're going to get you in trouble right now, right here on the yeah, air. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, mark <laughs> mark mark the time index, people, uh, for the show notes. Um, it's Veronica Roth. Oh, oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah, if people don't know, uh, John published Veronica's recent book, uh, Chosen Ones. And actually, I just watched John. I just watched you did a live. Like, she had her own YouTube oh, yeah. interview that she did with you and, and her agent. So that was kind of cool. Oh, yeah, right, right, yeah. Um. Yeah, but so uh, so if you're listening to this, you know, see if uh, that name got bleeped out or not. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> if if so, you can assume John has probably been sacked. <laughs> um, but, um, but the other thing I really wanted to... Ask quickly, just right off the bat here, is Toby, I saw that you uh, had a like a writing credit on Doom Eternal, the the video game. Like, how did I that did. happen? That's awesome. <laughs> uh, it, it Just like everything else in the writing world, it's it's just random, right? <laughs> uh, they, uh, they got a recommendation uh, to check me out uh, and looked at my work, like what they saw, and reached out to my agent and said, hey, does Toby want to write content for uh doom downloadable content uh number one and yeah, i'm a huge dune dune blah, 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 blah. <laughs> i'm not <laughs> today's the day of chewing our words uh i'm a I've huge, been a huge dune fan i really wish i'd been hired to work on that <laughs> <laughs> it's so close it's just like a yeah. letter different <laughs> <laughs> i'll never work again um <laughs> <laughs> So uh, uh, the corporation just reached out to me and asked if I'd be willing to do some work with them on that downloadable content, uh, one, uh, writing the hell papers. And uh, I love Doom. I, it was one of the first, uh, you know, uh, Wolfenstein 3D was the first, but like Doom was like the second or third first person shooter I ever played. Mm. And when they approached me, I was like, this is, even if I don't get the gig, this is a great excuse to download it and play. So yeah, my poor family, they uh, had to put up with me playing because no one was leaving for school or anything in COVID lockdown. So I was just playing Doom and, you know, uh, listening to that heavy metal and killing demons left and right and having fun. So and it's they, for work. Know, me up to... <laughs> it, it was for work. <laughs> no, literally, one of my daughters kind of rolled by and was just like, why are you even playing this? And I'm like, I'm on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> These are billable hours, baby. It, it it literally actually was billable hours because I was being, uh, you know, uh, I was charging by the hour for the work I did. It was one of those mm. kind of gigs. So I actually, you know, I got to bill for the time I spent playing the video game to kind of wrap my head around what the newest one was like, uh, which is to say hella fun. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Emphasis so, on hell. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> hella fun on hell. So, yeah, I, I, I got to work with the, the lead writer, Hugo. Uh, it was it was one of the more fun creative gigs I've ever done. Uh, if you play it and you pick up the Hell Papers, uh, you're reading me. So probably more people would read my Hell Papers for that than will ever read my original fiction. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just uh, got to actually help out a little bit with some of the ideas for what might be in uh, downloadable content, too. Um, and... Just, I don't know, it was a really fun three or four weeks. And I was really surprised that I got such a really nice placement on the uh, credits. They gave me a really nice writer's credit there for helping out. Uh, they put me next to the lead writer. So I was caught off guard and blown away. But it was really cool to be reading the scripts and seeing what was going to come out long before anyone else was. And uh, it was fun to 
fun to play it and see my own words on the screen there. And then a couple of my writing students like reached out to me and were like, holy crap, <laughs> our professor is at the, in the credits of doom. So <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. for, for a month, it was like really fun. And it also kind of gave me a kick in the ass to get off uh, social media, which also mm. ended up being really like mentally healthy for the uh, mm. uh, lockdown and everything like that. So it was just an all around really positive experience. Yeah, well, you know, Doom, the original Doom and Doom Two are, are my like two of my all time favorite games, and I was really, really good at them back in high school, and I'm apparently not really good at Doom anymore. Even even <laughs> after having played like hundreds and hundreds of hours of Doom 2016, I sort of play it while I'm listening to interviews and stuff that I have to listen to to prepare for these uh, for this podcast. But even after playing it for hundreds and hundreds of hours, I just barely made it to the end of Doom Eternal on the easiest difficulty setting, and I'm completely obliterated by the um ancient gods like i i cannot make it through the, <laughs> like what is it the hell swamp or something no matter what i do so you need to tell them to they, they need an easier mode like an easier mode below the you know <laughs> below the easy mode so that i can find out what you wrote for the game because i'm really curious to see what it is <laughs> i'm utterly embarrassed to admit that like when i downloaded uh doom eternal that uh, i got stuck in like the first five minutes of it trying to <laughs> knock out the like a chunk of wall to move on to the next part of the level. Like I just wandered around this, like, I think it's like the third level you get onto when you're playing it. I wandered that for like two hours trying to figure out how to get to the next part. I felt like my kids were like watching me and shaking their heads. (laughs) It was like really embarrassing. Uh, And like, finally at like 11 o'clock after everyone had gotten to bed, I finally like figured it out and was just like, I'm a moron. And (laughs) And then there's like no one to like shout that like I, you know, look, I kicked down the piece of rock. I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> oh, everyone went to bed. Great. <laughs> no, it's, it, it's, it's hard. Like, I don't know. I, I think it is, but I, we, let's, we, let's get into the, uh, the actual topic for today's episode, sure. which is the uh, you know, best American science fiction and fantasy 2020. And so Barrow, you know, one of the big reasons I wanted to have you on this episode is because you had two stories in this anthology. So um, what was that like? Was you were pretty, I imagine you were pretty psyched to get two stories in a best American kind of anthology. I, I really was. I was, I was very um, surprised and pleased, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought I had a, had a pretty good year um, in 2019 and it's, it's nice to have the confirmation, but I, you, you don't, you don't expect that. You never expect that. Um well, but so so tell us like about the, these stories though. Like, how did you do? You remember like how you got the ideas for them, or like how they came to be published, like stuff like that. So, um, bullet point uh, is actually JJA's fault, um, since I I wrote that for uh, I think it's Wastelands Three, um, right? And uh, the reason it's set in Las Vegas is because the story that I had published in the first Wastelands anthology takes place in and around Las Vegas because I lived in Las Vegas when I wrote it. And also Las Vegas is a great place to have an apocalypse because Mm -hmm. it's hot and flat and ringed by mountains and kind of this weird city state uh, that is divorced from the rest of the world by the, um, physical barriers of, you know, desert and mountains and vast distances. Uh, So if you, you know, wake up one morning and discover that everybody else on earth has just sort of vanished uh, and you're in Las Vegas, you probably need to leave, Uh, which is most of the, (laughs) but getting out is extremely difficult. Um, And uh, erase, erase, erase. I think, uh, that that one's a very odd little story. That was originally published in um, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And that one, um, I like fountain pens. You know, I use fountain pens a lot and have for, I, I grew up using them. Um, and I was actually in the process of, of fixing a pen and I had the idea for this story about this this person who um, is a writer with a traumatic past, and I I think in the in my original idea the, the character was going to be a ghost, um, 
And as I developed the story, I realized it was much more interesting if she was somebody who was not dead, but was kind of fading in and out of reality and struggling to communicate. Um, which could be kind of a magic realism metaphor for some of what trauma feels like, you know, the, the sort of sense of unreality that I think all of us are pretty familiar with as we enter, uh, you know, month 14 of 2020. <laughs> yeah. Well, could, could I ask you, there's the, the, one of the lines that really jumped out at me in Erase, Erase, Erase is the narrator says, the first person narrator says, the water here at my house is soft from a surface reservoir, the same reservoir H.P. Lovecraft once wrote about as the mm-hmm. towns that now lie under it were drowning. Yeah. What's the story behind that line? So there's a, um, uh, I, I live in Western Massachusetts, actually quite close to the town of Waitley <laughs> for the Lovecraft fans out there. Um, and there's a the the bulk of Boston's water comes from uh this gigantic reservoir, the Quabbin Reservoir, that takes up a huge chunk of the middle third of the state. Um and what they did was they built two enormous dams, um and a whole bunch of, you know, it, as as often happens, a whole bunch of little farming towns got covered over by the water. Um, as the reservoir filled up, so people had to relocate and houses had to be knocked down. And um, Lovecraft wrote a story called "The Killer Out of Space." Uh, uh, call it "Killer Out of Space." And I, I think it's—I think the title is actually "The Killer Out of Space," and the the object, the monster, is the color out of space. But I could be wrong. It's been decades since I read the story. Um, that is set in one of those little towns, and. It just sort of, it, it, it's local area knowledge, um, and it seemed, the, the, the narrator of that story is very discursive uh, and um, editorializes a lot. And I thought that it was the sort of thing that um, somebody who was a writer who, you know, lived in this area might just comment on in passing. Yeah, that's cool. I never knew that that was a real, you know, I read the story, but I never realized that was a real reservoir or anything. Because, you know, some of Lovecraft's towns are just, you know, fictional towns that he wrote about. Oh, yeah. But but let me ask you, too, about the, the other story you mentioned, um, Bullet Point, because um, it falls really, really pretty clearly into sort of two subgenres, right? The sort of the, there's the last man mm-hmm. kind of genre going back to, to Mary Shelley's novel and the sort of like we have to repopulate the the earth kind of um, trope. So could you just talk about um, kind of like how you feel about those kinds of those two sort of sh- sub genres and how those influenced your, um, your story? I, I think probably the, the two biggest influences on that story are um, uh, Harlan Ellison's uh, A Boy and His Dog and uh, Joanna Russ's um, We Who Are About To. Uh, both of which are kind of people stranded, you know, post-apocalyptic landscape, isolation um, stories that that take on that trope. Um, Because it, you know, it's it's kind of a a facile, uh, oh, we're the last people on Earth, we have to repopulate the planet. Well, that's not going to work out so well for you genetically. (laughs) <laughs> but but also you know i i think it's a there there's that speaking as a woman um there's the whole you know not if you were the last man on earth thing <laughs> <laughs> and um and there's also this this uh, I, I that story is mostly about the gender dynamics of this guy who just assumes that he can move into this woman's life and sort of take it over and make it about him um, because he is the last man on earth. And so, th- I mean, that's, that's like really where as a writer, my, my focus, the focus of my commentary was, and, you know, sometimes it's better to, and I, I think this applies to men, women, and people of other genders as well. Sometimes it is much better to be alone than to be in a relationship that is probably 
you know, bad for you. Um, <laughs> so if, if, if the story has a thematic freight, a, a, an unsubtle thematic freight, I would say that that's what's behind it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll just say, I mean, these kinds of stories, I mean, you know, it's this whole tradition, but every time I read another one, I'm always instantly pulled into it. There's just something about the last person on earth kind of, you know, idea that, that I, I, I'm always just really, um, intrigued by. And I actually, um, back at episode 308, if people are curious, I interviewed Gordon Van Gelder. He edited an anthology called Go Forth and Multiply, where it's all these, it's like the whole history of these, um, you know, we have to repopulate the planet kind of stories. And uh, I just think it's really interesting. Um, But I want to get uh, Toby back in here too. So Toby, tell us about your story that you wrote for, that ended up in uh, Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy 2020. Of course. Yeah. The, you know, the genesis for the story come, came from a, uh, you know, every once in a while I get lucky enough to be uh, flown down to the Caribbean to do like a workshop or to read and things like that because of my roots there, both in the fiction and my personal roots. And I was in the Bahamas and I was pulled over and had taken a look at this massive uh, tourist hotel resort complex built by the same people who made the Palm Islands off of the Middle East, I think uh, Dubai, uh, they made this huge sort of uh, Aztec themed resort in the Bahamas that takes over not just the size of a resort, but a small island and a private uh, handful of beaches and things like that. And, you know, the, the, the island is small enough that this thing is just huge on it. And I was looking at it and just staring at it. And a friend of mine was docked there uh, and took me on a walking tour of the whole complex. And it was like, I don't know, visiting a space station. It was like this, it was like this structure, this monolith, this thing. And it was the first time I'd kind of felt the instantiation of the tourist structure, the tourist economy in like a single unit, a single visible piece of infrastructure. And it kind of blew me away. And and it was when I was standing there, I pulled out my uh, phone and I wrote down tourist industrial complex, (laughs) exclamation point, exclamation (laughs) point, exclamation point, thinking about the famous speech of, you know, the military industrial complex. And I, I put that down and I just had been kind of like, thinking about writing an essay or something along those lines, talking about it and comparing it to the military industrial complex. But uh, when I got the request to write a story for new sons, I uh, was kind of, you know, getting close to the deadline and noodling around ideas. And I thought, well, maybe there's something here. So I set out to write this story about tourism and its effects, but kind of flipped the metaphor so that it was, you know, Manhattan in the U S that was being, kind of treated like a small island and being developed by aliens, really. And I used Manhattan because I know that there's a lot of discussion about gentrification and and outside forces and real estate uh, there. So I felt it would have some like resonances, you know, kind of like play a power chord. So I kind of just set out to write this piece, uh, playing with those themes. Well, I I thought it was so interesting because usually in science fiction, when aliens come to Earth, they're either coming to wipe everyone out or they're coming to teach us their superior wisdom. And just this idea that their their massive wealth might turn us into a tourist trap uh, where the entire economy becomes reoriented around servicing the alien visitors. I thought it was a really interesting um, idea that I'm not sure I've seen a ton of uh, in science fiction before. I guess. I mean, one of the things is that that I talk about this stuff all the time whenever I go back down home and, and talk to people there, and, you know, who are both positive about the jobs that are created by tourism and people who are burnt out by it and people who just loathe it. You know, in particular, one of the things I started seeing were these economic uh, parallels between stuff that people were struggling with in the Midwest, which is where I currently live. You know, so, uh, you know, we have all this research that shows like when a Walmart drops in it you know destroys the 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 little you know small businesses around it and then you know takes over and that in and of itself isn't a, isn't a problem necessarily the, the 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 bigger problem which is invisible to a lot of people who aren't looking at the economics of it is that it's not only that the big box retail store displaces those other stores is that when those other stores take your money they 
if they're small local businesses, spend money with other small local businesses. And this sort of like uh, multiple effect of money passing through an economy multiple times actually creates kind of an engine, um, which is hard to kind of wrap your head around. But that goes away when uh, you have like a almost like a wormhole that sucks all the money out from the community and sends it back to headquarters. And tourism does the same thing. A lot of the cruise ship docks, they will buy up land around the cruise ship docks and put in their own uh, businesses. Right. So like if you go buy jewelry on an island uh, and you only walk, you know, a third of a mile or a quarter of a mile away from the cruise ship, you, you may well actually be economically still on the on, on the ship. Um, and so a lot of the jobs that are created are more uh, uh, low blue collar jobs, you know, taxi driver, uh, as the hero of the story is, um, as well as people who service tourists. Right. Uh, in many different ways. And so I just was like, what does this look like if you just say like all of America, all of the developed world and in, in, in uh, our society basically then is being forced to do the same thing that these uh, less powerful economies are forced to do. And I just wanted to kind of make that real for the reader. Well, well speaking of those sorts of economic things, this, this line kind of jumped out at me that I wanted to ask you about. It says, the cop taking Tavi's statement wore a yellow jumpsuit with logos advertising a financial district casino. Risk your money here, just like they used to in the old stock market. Win big, <laughs> ring the old bell. <laughs> so I take it there is no more stock market in this future, and maybe it was destroyed by the GameStop revolt. Or like <laughs> Yeah, I mean, all of that just gets uh, ripped away by the much larger sort of colonial structure that that kind of sits in. Uh, from tourism, right? You, you, a lot of the existing infrastructures and ecosystems and uh, money ecosystems just uh, gets blasted away by this huge thing uh, in many cases, right? I think in the Bahamas, it's something like 60% of the economy is based on tourism. And so they're really struggling right now, uh, which I didn't foresee when I was standing there looking at it. But I went like, you know, this thing has such an effect on the entire island. It's it's kind of mind boggling. Um and it just served as a great symbol for me, uh, which is why I started kind of, you know, working on like the, uh, the classic science fictional idea of like the uh, elevator to space, right? That'll be our version of a cruise ship dock. Um, and uh, I've seen governments bankrupt themselves trying to extend or make larger cruise ship docks, right? So I thought like, oh, great, let's, let's, have, a, let's have the U.S. government completely bankrupt itself building a space elevator that <laughs> then falls apart for some reason. Um, so yeah, just trying to to take the metaphor and and flip it so that people can see it uh, for for what it might be. But also, like you said, like the the way in which uh, you know. So backing it up a bit, I have this book somewhere on my shelf, and I'm going to butcher the title, but it's basically about the colonial um, underpinnings of science fiction and how tied up you know the late 1800s, early 1900s are with science fiction and when it came to be and how colonial that era was. And it has a big effect on our genre. And so a lot of times aliens are stand-ins for, uh, you know, you know, think of H.G. Wells, right? The, he, he wrote the aliens to kind of be like the British invading other countries and how hard it was to stand up against them. And so I kind of, you know, there's this long history of kind of playing with these metaphors in science fiction, both negative and positive, um, to try and get people to see what it feels like and show what it feels like if their country was treated like their country is currently treating another country. And so I just, you know, this isn't me just like crapping all over tourism 100%. Like I, I like to travel too, but there are the, just these dark sides of tourism uh, that just do need tackled with. And I thought just running with that, you know, what what does the invasion look like if it's tourists? And, and let's take this kind of seriously, not all for laughs. Um, because most of the tourist invasion stories I've seen in science fiction have been 100% just giggle. Right. But I just wanted to show that, like, yeah, this this affects lives. This affects people. Yeah, no, it's a super cool story. Um, so I want to get uh, John back in here. So, John, uh, I'm just going to read. These are the magazines and anthologies that the stories in your anthology come from. So we got mm -hmm. Amazing Stories, Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, Nightmare, The New Yorker, Uncanny Magazine, Tor.com, Lightspeed and Weird Tales. And then these anthologies, Wastelands, The New Apocalypse, New Suns, The People's Future of the United States, Future Tense and The Mythic Dream. Now, I haven't paid super close attention to short fiction for a little while, but last I heard uh, Amazing Stories and Weird Tales were like out of business. 
did they come like how did i so they're back now like when did they come back can you tell me about that uh yeah so i mean amazing stories has been uh like i don't know it's kind of a weird situation like uh a guy named steve davidson uh i guess he somehow came into possession of like uh a trunk of documents or something that uh somehow ended up with him having the trademark of tra amazing stories. I I'm not really sure I understand how it worked, but anyway, he revived it a couple years ago and it had sort of been slowly building online as sort of a, um, uh, like a website. Uh, and, and they only slowly had been publishing fiction and then, uh, and they still haven't gotten into like a regular publication schedule, if I recall correctly. Um, but they definitely had at least the one issue last year, um, or I mean, 2019, uh, maybe more than that, but I, I mean, there was the only the one story that I, uh, ended up putting on my, on my long list and, and of course got selected for the, for the book. Um. And then Weird Tales, uh, kind of a similar situation. Um, I mean, it did get revived a couple of years ago. Um, over the last couple of years, they've only released like one or two issues a year, depending on the year. Um, I'm not sure offhand how many it was in 2019. I think it was only one, though. I think it was. Um, and then last year, I think they released two. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure what's happening with those in terms of like, are they ever going to get back up to uh, you know, regular publication schedule, but, um, yeah, they're, they're both magazines that won't die. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it makes sense for weird tales. I mean, like, you know, you would think if any magazine was going to be undead, it would be weird tales. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, you know, um, yeah, they just keep coming back and, uh, uh, so yeah, still publishing some good stuff though, obviously like, uh, you know, Victor Laval's story and Weird Tales, like that, that was so amazing. And and this uh, S.P. Somtow story and Amazing Stories, that was also amazing. You know, I mean, obviously, <laughs> I I think a lot of these stories are amazing that I that are in this book and that I put on the long list. That's why I put them there. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll just say real quick, uh, uh, of the things you mentioned, Future Tense, uh, that's not actually an anthology. That's a that's a um a project of Slate. Uh, the website Slate, they have like this whole science fiction thing. It's kind of a magazine, but kind of like it's kind of in a weird space. Uh, but it's basically like an online magazine. Uh, but it doesn't really have it's like its own thing. It's just kind of like a subsection of Slate. It's it's also in uh, cooperation with Arizona State University. Right. And right. yeah, I did a story for them last year, I think, uh, or two years ago. I don't know what <laughs> it's it's 2020 forever. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a really interesting structure that they're using. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, can someone um, fill me in on that? Because, yeah, I noticed that, you know, one of the stories, uh, one of my favorite stories from the book was um, Between the Dark and the Dark by mm -hmm. Deji Bryce Alakotun. And I, I just noticed in his bio that he's affiliated with this. Um, it's like the Center for the Study of the Imagination or something at Arizona mm -hmm. State. Does anyone anyone know more about that? Um, yeah, I can talk about it a little bit because um, I've I've done a bunch of work with they they did the the uh, hieroglyph hieroglyph project a few years back, mm -hmm. um, and now they're doing this future tense thing where they get a science fiction writer uh, and a person who is uh, in the field that the story is addressing, and basically you you as the writer coming in, which is the perspective I can talk about, uh, talk about it from, you talk to some, uh, talk to some specialists in whatever field it is that you're addressing. Um, mine was industrial safety. <laughs> um, I never thought I'd get to write a story about industrial safety, but I did. And I loved it. <laughs> um, and, uh, then you, have a um you write the story uh it goes through a usual editorial process and they have somebody write a uh a, a response like like an expert in the field you're writing about does a, a factual essay discussing the actual science and futurism behind it and they publish those together at slate that's interesting because, yeah, because I was really impressed in Deji's story how it's about a generation ship and um, there's a lot of technical details about the um, sort of the biome or wh whatever you call it, you know, the uh, the aquaculture mm -hmm. uh, that keeps the ship, uh, the people, the, the the crew fed. And uh, I was just really impressed how, you know, how much technical detail there was. So it was really interesting for me to hear, oh, that's such a great resource where you can just, you know, mm. 
be in this community of, of different people with different specializations and, and they all kind of, you know, help you out mm -hmm. with your story. I think that's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, ASU is also doing uh, some um, anthology still uh, besides just the, the hieroglyph project. Um, like, so in 2020, they had one out called Us in Flux. Uh, so, you know, us as in, you know, all of mm -hmm. us, uh, us in flux. Um, and it's it's kind of like future tense where like, I, I believe you just Google it. It's just you can read all the stories online. Um, but uh, yeah, that one, I kind of feel like it feels like an anthology because it's not an ongoing project, at least as far as I could tell. Um, so it's one of those weird things where like when you're forced to being in a position like I am of like trying to fit things into slots and like, well, how do I talk about this thing from a bibliographical uh, standpoint? Uh, it makes it complicated. It's like, is it an anthology? Is it something else? Uh, is it something we don't have a, you know, a framework for? Um, uh, like Amazon has been released, Amazon original stories, they've been releasing these uh, different uh, collections of short stories they look like an anthology, but they're all, but they're not bound up into like one ebook. They're, they're released as like, here's a project, here's the name of the project. And then here's the four, five or six or whatever, you know, stories that are in it. And so I started thinking of them as deconstructed anthologies <laughs> because, you know, they're clearly, you know, like an anthology. It's just that they're, but they're broken up like that, but they're not, they're not a continuing project. So they're not a magazine. Uh, so it's, it's one of those interesting things that the modern age has given us uh, that there's all these different ways of uh, finding homes for short stories. Yeah. The uh, whole thing is uh, put together by like, yeah, the center for science and imagination at ASU, like bear said, and uh, Joey Eshrich is the guy there who does uh, point on a lot of this stuff. Who's a, a lot of fun and, They've been doing some really cool things. They did some uh, climate change stuff as well. And uh, they tend to have this model where when they do the anthologies, they try to pair up scientists and uh, writers together to kind of bounce off of each other. Uh, it's it's real interesting. I've been involved in a, in a couple of them. And uh, before uh, COVID and everything, it was really cool to go out to Arizona State University. Like there's a whole center for this, you know, imagination yeah. Yeah. and and futurism and creativity and science kind of where they intersect. And I just like, I was like, I wish I'd known that this thing existed when I was <laughs> much younger. I would have <laughs> loved to have gotten a degree there. <laughs> oh, was it actually around that long? Like even when, uh, you know, when we were all younger, like it was, I don't know. Like Part of it's I'm old own. and cool yeah. things have popped up since I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so, um, so bear, when we were kind of chatting over email, um, you mentioned some of these stories that you thought you might want to talk about on the panel. So Life Sentence by Matthew Baker, 33 Wicked Daughters by Kelly Barnhill, Thoughts and Prayers by Ken Liu, and Up from Slavery by Victor Laval. Is there anything just sort of off the bat you think you might want to bring up uh, for us to, to talk about uh, with, with, with any of those stories? Sure. Um, dude, uh, I know I know other people wanted to talk about Life Sentence as well. So why don't we, why don't we start off with that one? Okay, yeah, it's the first story in the book, yeah. so that would be a good place to start. And I think I also read that one. I'm on the uh, I'm on the uh, permanent floating sturgeon award jury, uh, and I I should mention that uh, Toby's story was uh, on our uh, short list this past year as well. And I think I think the Matthew Baker we also read for the sturgeon award. Um, one of the things that I I really enjoyed about it is that you get a real sense both of so, so it's a story about somebody who has been it's it's a it's a post prison story about somebody who has been punished for committing a crime by having his memories erased so that basically he can go out and become hopefully a a new human being uh who is no longer violent um and we never find out exactly what it is that he's done, but um, it's it's about him attempting to come to terms with have, having been erased, uh, having been, you know, and the, the like. The really weird and uncomfortable thing is that he just gets taken and sent back to his own life with his family and. They, of course, all know everything, but they're not allowed judicially to talk to him about it. Um, and I, I 
still find myself thinking, like thinking about this story and chewing it over and chewing over aspects of it. Um, and there, there are stories that I love that I read and I'm like, oh yeah, totally right on a hundred percent. You know, <laughs> you go get them tiger. And this story was not like that for me. This was like, I really don't know what I think about this. I, I'm deeply, <laughs> un- I'm made deeply uncomfortable by so many aspects in this story. And, and, but in a, in a good way, in a way that makes me thoughtful and think about criminal justice and, um, how people become violent. Yeah. I mean, John, do you, uh, do you remember, uh, why you picked the story for your uh, long list originally? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, and I actually published this in light speed originally. So, uh, you know, I, I, I obviously loved it in a number, a number of times. Uh, hmm. but, uh, you know, when 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 I actually put something on the long list that's from Lightspeed, it's always like a sign that I definitely like super love that story because I had to pick it from all those other stories that I love that I published in Lightspeed. Uh, you know, those are the hardest ones to pick because it's like those are all my babies. You know, so <laughs> I got to pick which baby do I love the most um, and and hope someone else loves it also, like you know the guest editor. Um, but yeah, no, I I just I really love all the themes that it's playing with, like with this. Uh, I, I love stories that play with memory like that. And, uh, you know, uh, this whole notion of, um, uh, you know, criminal justice. And, and of course it touches on like gun control issues and everything since it's, you know, uh, there's strong suggestion that he did some sort of criminal act with guns. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just, I, I thought it was really interesting. Um, and, and that writer, Matthew Baker is actually a really interesting writer uh, beyond that story too. Um, he had a collection come out, uh, I think, in 2019 called uh why visit america and the title story of that is just phenomenal also and uh you know a lot of great stories in there uh but he's like he's kind of more from the literary side of things uh, i think i think maybe this story in lightspeed was the first time he published in an actual genre uh publication but basically all everything he writes is genre um but uh but yeah, you know, I just really, I really loved it. Um, I, uh, I felt like it shared a lot in common with the the Black Mirror episode. Um, I think it's called White yeah. Christmas. Uh, and it it totally felt like a Black Mirror episode to me. Um, maybe maybe uh maybe uh too close to uh that particular Black Mirror episode to also be a Black Mirror episode. That's a different <laughs> one. <laughs> but uh, but it, it it, you know. It, it it fired on a lot of those same cylinders that makes me love Black Mirror. So, um, and I think I think around then was uh, uh, maybe uh, maybe when there was like a fresh season of it. So it was like I was still super like it was still super in my mind. Of course, after 2020, it's like well, I don't know how much I want to watch Black Mirror. But, <laughs> uh, but I I actually just I actually did just reread that story in prep for this, and and I I still thought it was amazing, and you know gave me chills all over again. And you know I hadn't read it in a long time. Yeah. Well, well, no, it's a super cool story, and I think that idea is really interesting of instead of sending people to prison, you erase their memories. And there's just been a lot. It's kind of been in the air recently, like people talking about what might alternatives to prisons be. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting premise. Um, and I just I like the idea of erasing memories, you know. Um, the the story that kind of got me into the science fiction community right. that won the Asimov Award was about erasing memory. So it's something I've been interested in for a long time. Mm-hmm. And actually one of the most interesting, and you know, like I love the the original Total Recall with Arnold Schwarzenegger and everything. And one of the ideas that I thought that has just come up on the show recently that I was one of my favorite things that we talked about was when I interviewed um, Arkady Martin about uh, her, her novel Memory Called Empire was I think it's, it's, it's more or less a throwaway line in the book, but it, it talks about how your memories aren't the same as your personality. And in Total Recall, it's sort of presented as if your memories and who you are is basically the same thing. And if you took someone's memories, you know, if you took the memories out of one person and put them in someone else, then that person would have effectively transferred their consciousness into the other person. And she was kind of making, I don't remember exactly if I'm quoting her right, but she was basically making the point, well, no, like if you took someone's memories, like like say I were to take have someone else's memories put in my body, I might be like, oh, I remember loving licorice or something and then i eat licorice i'm like oh this is awful i don't remember like why did i why did i used to like this stuff i always liked it in the past but it's good because there is there are aspects to yourself that are independent of your memories so i don't i just think the science fiction stories that deal with that really you know bring up lots of interesting issues like that um i'm gonna get toby back in here toby do you want to talk about that story or or any other stories in the book that kind of jumped out at you uh, you made an interesting point about uh, memory, and I was just thinking about Vienna sausages. 
how much I used to love those as a kid. Buy this little uh, tin can for like, I think it was like a quarter. And uh, I would just eat them straight out of the can when I was a kid. And, you know, 20 years later or so, I went back and was browsing through a store and saw some of them for sale and grabbed one, went home, opened it up and took a bite of one. And it was the nastiest thing I've (laughs) ever eaten. Oh my gosh. So as you were talking about that, I was sitting here contemplating like, you know, the difference, like you said, you'd have this memory of liking licorice and then hating it. And I was just immediately like, yes, I have this really strong sense memory of loving Vienna sausage. And whoever I am today is so different because I can't stand it. Well, so you you think that uh, someone implanted all your childhood memories? It's not really. Well, I mean, it's it's like that, and the fact that they clearly implanted the memory of me, uh, you know, uh, reading a book called the Berenstein Bears instead of the Berenstain <laughs> Bears. Uh, <laughs> so clearly, something has happened, you know, and my my reality of uh, my my younger ages and now is not the same. The the, the Berenstain Bears thing, I think, is evidence that we are actually on a branch timeline. Or just in a computer simulation. Right? <laughs> Maybe, mm-hmm. yeah. There's a glitch in the Matrix. Uh, can I just say, uh, like, while it's fun to imagine that all of Toby's childhood memories were implanted by someone, I think it's more fun to imagine that it's just the Vienna sausages thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, just like like random memory uh, defiling, like, or you know, like <laughs> it's like like a graffiti uh, a graffiti artist just sort of randomly well, uh, tagging your memory. It's like the memory. it's like the ultimate marketing campaign, right? They just the Vienna <laughs> yeah, sausage yeah, yeah. company just goes around <laughs> implanting. Like, wait, I love these things, and then you buy them. You're like, ugh. Why did yeah, I it's, a huge ad, it's a huge cents. ad campaign. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before we run out of time, I, I do have a couple more stories I want to hit, hopefully, before we uh, wrap this up. Um, so I, I was really, really impressed with this Ken Liu story called Thoughts and Prayers. Mm-hmm. And it's, I mean, it's it's just sort of like very, very near future science fiction. I mean, most of the stuff in it is pretty much here. It's just sort of pushing the AI and, and such a little bit further into the future. But the premise basically is that there's a um, a young woman who's killed in a mass shooting, and then her parents kind of go, um, you know, become campaigners for gun control. And then they get targeted really, really uh, ruthlessly by internet trolls who do all sorts of horrible things uh, with their daughter's image online. And um, it's and it's just a real gut punch of a story, but I think that the um, the part that actually struck me the most is that it's 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 sort of like a um, you know it, it's it's a collage of of first person accounts from the different characters, and toward the end you get an account from the point of view of, of just sort of this this random troll who has kind of an interesting interestingly mm-hmm. philosophical justification or rationale for why he's done what he's done, um, and I'll just. I guess I'll just read this quickly. So this is part of what he says. He says, everyone is a troll now. If you've ever liked or shared a meme that wished violence on someone you'd never met, if you've ever decided it was okay to snarl and snark with venom because the target was, quote, powerful, if you've ever tried to signal your virtue by piling on in an outraged mob, if you've ever wrung your hands and expressed concern that perhaps the money raised for some victim should have gone to some other less, quote, privileged victim, then I hate to break it to you. You've also been trolling. And... um. Yeah, I, I just thought the story, because because these things, at least, I mean, to me, it, these issues are genuinely really complicated. Like, um, so in this story, they, um, they're they like, well, we're not going to have censorship. We're just going to give people more and more powerful tools to block out, uh, you know, harassment or like the, the views of people who are bothering you or whatever. And that's kind of like a better, that's better than censorship. And then that, that kind of like, there's some issues with that. And then, yeah, and just this whole issue of like, who isn't like, who isn't on the Internet? Who isn't a troll? Is, are any of us pure? Uh, I think it's really all really interesting issues that the story brought up to me. Um, so I guess I guess, Bear, do you um, do you have any opinions on on that story? Like, how did it strike you? I mean, it, I, I agree with everything you said about it. It's really a very, yeah, like five minutes into the future. Um, most of this technology already exists. It is definitely, I think the thing that struck me most about it is that it's very much a 
comment, it seems to me, on the um, like abnegation of responsibility that uh, social media platforms um, have. Like they, we have no responsibility for what people post. Um, but we'll give you filters, you know, we'll let you block people. We'll let you mute conversations. Um, and speaking as somebody who's been brigaded once or twice, because, Hey, I'm a woman on the internet. Uh, <laughs> um, you still know that stuff is going on, you know, stuff gets through the filters. Um, and as, as we have learned, as as you know a nation um in the past month filtering stuff out doesn't make it go away and it has real world consequences which can include people dying you know and so i feel like this is possibly the most prescient story in the book the, the you know this is an accurate piece of futurism as far as i'm concerned well, and there's a line in the story that says explicitly, it, it sort of says like the, um, isn't it funny that the the sort of free speech ethos of these companies happens to coincide so neatly with their bottom, with what's good for their bottom line. <laughs> and um, I mean, and I, I am a, a huge proponent of free speech and that's why this is so difficult for me because it's not like, I don't feel like I know the answer. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm genuinely perplexed about about how to, have free speech and have, and, 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 but you know, how, how to have like a public discourse that isn't toxic without impinging on free speech. I'm honestly sort of at a loss to, as to what to do about that. Uh, I have to say, uh, so this story, like, I mean, and actually this whole conversation so far, like, I'm just like, getting like chills sitting here thinking about it. Cause like having, you know, just reread the story again, it's like, it's like, it's so like right in that ideal uh, spectrum of what I love about science fiction and like, like I just want more of of that. Like if I if, if I could find uh you know fifty stories a year like that, Lightspeed would probably be full of stories like that 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 fire on those uh, cylinders. Like you know having that uh uh that prescience to it and and hitting on all those issues in a way. But like 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 sure you could label this an issue story and complain about it if you're somebody who complains about those things. But it's like. But it's like presenting it in such a way that like I feel like it, it negates that argument. Like, no, no, no. This is like this is art. This is a hundred percent art because of how deeply it makes you think about what's happening in the story and how like closely you get into the heads of these characters. Um and, and there's no good uh, there's no good guys or bad guys. In right. The story. Right, right. Um and you know, I had actually uh and I love I love I absolutely love the title. Uh, uh, you know, I, I actually, um, had, uh, brainstormed, I wanted to do, a, a like a gun control science fiction fantasy anthology at some point. And I, I sort of started to talk to some people about it and just like, um, a bunch of the sort of, uh, a bunch of the folks that I felt like I wa really wanted to get had said no. And so I was like, I, I kind of like put it on the shelf cause I was like, well, you can't really do a book like that without it, without going like all the way with it. Like you really got to, it's really got a big be a big deal if you're if you're going to do it and so i sort of shelved it but um you know so seeing it like like the, the the idea that a story like this could have emerged from it like makes me think like oh god i should <laughs> i really should have pushed <laughs> further on that one because it's like and, and i mean i've seen other stories uh that that tackle gun control issues in, in a really amazing way but uh yeah this this story i feel like this is like the best thing ken lu's ever written and he's written some really amazing stories like you know won all kinds of awards and everything but it's like this this is like the pinnacle Bravo, Ken Liu. <laughs> <laughs> Ken is really a complete uh, master of the short form. Like, mm -hmm. just, uh, it is always a pleasure to read a Ken story. Just always a pleasure. And actually, I don't know if we've even mentioned yet, but the guest editor for this year was Diana Gabaldon. Oh, yeah. I guess I mentioned it in the um, in, in the mm -hmm. intro there. But, um, so she has a really, really great, um, you know, introduction that she wrote for this volume uh, with a bunch of really great observations. But one of the things she says is, a good story almost always includes a layer of social commentary, but in latter years, I'm seeing many more explicitly political stories. And this was kind of me, reminding me of a uh, Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy related uh, pile on, <laughs> internet pile on phenomenon, which is that I guess the last panel we did, the uh, the headline that I wrote for Wired 
was, or no, wait, sorry, that maybe it was for People's Future of the United States. Oh. Hmm. But the headline that I wrote for Wired was science fiction is getting increasingly political. Mm -hmm. And the, I don't know, somebody at Wired thought it would be punchier if they changed it to science fiction is getting more political, which literally means the same thing. But it's like a weird uh, aspect of the English language that when you say something is getting more something, it, it kind of sounds like you, you're saying it wasn't that before and it is now. And mm. so there was like this, <laughs> it was this like um, unbelievable, like, celebrities and like my best friends and stuff were all like making fun of this headline and be good. Oh, have you ever heard of yeah. Octavia Butler kind of stuff? Um, not knowing that I like wrote, well, that I wrote a, some version of the headline, but um, I don't know. I just thought that was a funny story. Mm -hmm. it, it made me think of it. The, the, the more explicitly political um, thing that Dana Gable done there, said there, but um, I don't know, Toby, what do you think about that? That, that idea, do you feel like science fiction is getting increasingly Political? <laughs> oh, good grief now. I mean, art is political. Art's political because it's created from real life. Uh, you know, if you don't see the politics in the art, if you don't see that, then uh, often it just means that the politics are very aligned to yours. So you kind of swim through it like a, you know, fish bothering about water. Uh, it only, you know, alarms you when it's suddenly not your water. You're like, why is this not salty water? Why am I in fresh water? Um, so it's a case of uh, science fiction, like, you know, a lot of science fiction was like libertarian and a lot of uh, people see that as invisible, uh, you know, and, and a lot of them, a lot of it has attitudes that they agree with. If you want to see like people get upset about stuff, all you have to do is just trawl through, you know, the fan letters and things like that, the columns around science fiction of any given time. I mean, don't forget there used to be these that I'm, I'm not lecturing you guys about this, but I just meant like the audience. Don't forget that like science fiction for a long time had this huge fault about like whether or not nuclear weapons were good or not. <laughs> and mm -hmm. some writers wrote about the horrors of nuclear war. And some of them wrote about how nuclear power was going to be so awesome. Um, and you go back and you read stuff in the fifties and you can see like this sort of like fictional textual, uh, debate happening. Right. So the, you know, for us, because we know how that kind of like sorted itself out in some ways, I still think there's a, you know, a lot to think about that still, well, but we've just stopped worrying about it as much, but you can read and see it developing. It's just that from 40 years, you know, further down the road, it looked kind of you know, not as political because it was not the number one kind of topic. We weren't doing like nuclear drills in our classrooms every day. But I mean, uh, you know, two science fiction art, uh, authors arguing about the possibilities of nuclear war versus nuclear tools back then, uh, you know, to a kid who's hiding underneath a table uh, for a duck and cover drill, it's this, it's not that dissimilar to students now having to do lockdown drills for a shooter and then science fiction writers arguing about gun control. I mean, we're trying to well, figure out. Sorry. Well, well, well yeah, let, let me just say, I mean, the thing that prompted that sort of thought was that there were, I think, three anthologies all coming out, out around the same times. Yeah. Uh, around the same time, they were all explicitly like the current president who we're, who we're naming is bad and needs to be removed. And I felt like, at least in my lifetime, that was sort of a novel development that was more political than than anything that I could really remember. Um, the seventies were like science fiction art. There were a lot of science fiction anthologies that were aggressively political. They all came out pretty close to each other. Um, I, but yeah, I think I think it's. The, I'm so sorry. Oh no, go ahead. What go were ahead. you saying? Um, uh, was, I'll slide in after oh, you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think like uh, I think the discussion about this stuff is more available because of the internet and social media, so people can grouse a lot more. But I think about you know uh, the these sorts of uh, flare ups, you know, as we try to you know deal with like the Vietnam War, you know, which was something that split science fiction writers politically and had them at each other's throats quite a bit back in the past. I think that just what happens is we have a poor sense of history. And a lot of things get forgotten about, you know, arguments that political arguments, political reasoning, political reasons for anthologies or stories having existed. And uh, so I think it starts to look less and less like we try to do those things. I think it may have been there was definitely a stronger reaction to the president 
of those four years than than there has ever been. Absolutely. I would definitely agree with that. But like that president and and the actions and things that happened were fairly unprecedented, right, uh, over the last hundred years. So, I mean, I, when was the last time there was an active armed insurrection that stormed through the Capitol building in this nation's history, right? So the fact that there were a bunch of anthologies trying to grapple with that before it happened, uh, it, I don't know if that's necessarily... Uh, all that surprising to me, Bear. You were, you were going to yeah, say, yeah. I, I, the writing was on the wall, so to speak. That um, mm-hmm. to to anybody who was paying attention, that things were likely to get very, very bad. Um, but the 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 thing I wanted to say, uh, and I'm sort of restating something Toby said, but I want to unpack it a little bit. It's not that science fiction is getting more political; it's that science fiction is getting more diverse. And therefore, mm. we are seeing a wider range of political and social opinions. And I think this is incredibly healthy for the genre. It is it is literally the thing that is saving the genre from irrelevance, as far as I'm concerned. Um, because there's there's only so many times you can write that same story from that same point of view and have it be interesting. Well, and to bring that all back to just this uh, best American science fiction and fantasy here, uh, just looking at uh, the different voices inside of this anthology shows, you know, what sort of a much more uh, a much more diverse science fiction than when I was coming up in the mm-hmm. field, right? Uh, I mean, we've got multiple people from the Caribbean writing stories in here. We've got, you know, uh, it's it's. The diversity of voices just in this anthology uh, mean that they're going to be a diverse group of uh, points of view and unpacking and looking at the modern political situation. I think uh, Bear makes an incredibly uh, good point because now what you have are more – the diversity means you have more writers who were going to be directly affected negatively by what was happening in the in the country at the time. So the fact that there would be um, – Art as a response of that is is not actually that shocking, really, um, and it's I think maybe a, a sign of the health, as Bear was saying, of the field. Yeah, well, that actually that kind of dovetails nicely into the next thing I wanted to bring up, and I didn't realize how much I wanted to talk about this until just before we recorded. So I don't know if everyone had you know will have read or, or reread this story, mm. um, but there's a story called "The Robots of Eden" by Anil Menon. And um, sort of so the, the the premise is that um, there are these implants that regulate your emotions and sort of, you know, keep you more on an even keel. And then as the story develops, one of the characters who has one of these implants starts arguing with a novelist that um, that these implants have kind of made fiction irrelevant, that fiction was a way of, um, you know, the, the the novelist is arguing that um that fiction was a way of developing your empathy for other kinds of people and this enhanced character is saying well no but i don't need empathy for other people because uh well i actually wrote it down um the character says in any case why had empathy even been necessary for humans because people had been like books in a foreign language the books had meaning but inaccessible meaning fortunately science had stepped in fixed the problem there was no need to be constantly on edge about other people's feelings one knew how they felt they felt happy content motivated and relaxed there was no more need to walk around in other people's shoes than there was to inspect their armpits for signs of the bubonic plague um, and I think there's there's just a ton of interesting stuff going on in this story, but um, yeah, but but it, it basically becomes this argument of like is what is the value of fiction basically, and um, I don't know if anyone if if anyone remembers the story well enough to um, comment on it, but um, if anyone, I'd be curious to hear anyone's thoughts if if you have any. Many years ago, I was talking to author Carl Schrader, and he mentioned offhand just whether or not there would be a function as much of a function for fiction uh, after we kind of nail down uh, the good drugs we need from (laughs) setting up our brains properly. Right. Like right now we have therapy and we have drugs and, and the, the whole science is very nascent still. Right. But like in 200 years, if you're like ridiculously well adjusted and calm uh, and, you know, cause you're, you know, technology has, has, stepped in like what does that mean for fiction 
and the unique feeling of getting into someone else's head as a way of kind of, like you said, broadening empathy. And at the time, it was just kind of a throwaway discussion. But uh, Anil's story uh, is, it was in New Sons as well, which is the where my story was. And I, I it's that that's something that keeps me up at night, to be honest, <laughs> like the idea of fiction no longer being needed um, kind of scares the crap out of me. I'm like, it's my job. It's the <laughs> one thing I'm good at. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't remember, I don't remember the details of the story well enough because uh, I didn't reread that one. But I mean, in terms of that particular argument, I mean, uh, the thing is, it's like, until we get to that point, fiction is so vital. I mean, if, if there's anything that the the misery of the last several years has taught us, is, it, or at least reinforced to me, is that, uh, you know, uh, people really need fiction to understand how other people think. And I think that's a large part of why there are so many people who are like, um, you know, uh, you know, they stopped, they, they never read a book uh, since high school willingly (laughs) you know and it's like uh it's it's not as surprising that they really don't know how to interact with other human beings or how to take their feelings into consideration because they're just stuck in their own head all the time uh but yeah i think i mean i think we're a long way from where drugs are gonna sort that out and i'm not even honestly sure that like drugs could actually ever properly sort all that out um i mean it might make everybody so balanced out that uh it's irrelevant what anybody does, but um, I don't know. I I don't think that the only value of fiction is in letting us have empathy for other people though. I mean, I think that's, that's a, that's a huge chunk of it, but it also allows us to have uh, philosophical arguments with ourselves and ethical arguments with ourselves and test ideas to destruction and set up, thought experiments and just play and the thing is that narrative is how we understand the world like it is the thing that our brains are optimized to do that's why when we when people write history they create a narrative and inevitably those narratives leave stuff out because history isn't a narrative history is you know (laughs) a series of events um but our our brains only really process information well as a story um and i know at least for me the healthier and happier and saner i am the more challenging fiction i can handle like this this past year just reading any fiction has been incredibly hard um and reading challenging fiction has been even harder and because my brain is so busy Mm -hmm figuring out how to get groceries mm-hmm. without dying or killing anybody else, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> that maybe I just want to read an Agatha Christie story when I get home. <laughs> that makes me kind of wonder, like uh, all of the, the, the TV shows and fiction that we've been really loving this year, what they'll look like to us in five, six, seven years. Right. Because I know that I've been watching a lot of stuff that five years prior, I would have been like, that is so cheesy. Mm-hmm. It is so saccharine, <laughs> like never in a million years. Uh, I want to go watch something dark with an anti-hero, and you know now I'm consuming. You know now like you know Shit's Creek is like part of what kept me alive, right? And I wonder if in four years, I mean, I think I'll still like the what it did, but I think in like four years I might be like, I don't know, this is too warm and cuddly. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I was going to say uh, on that point. Uh, so first of all, well, Schitt's Creek is legitimately a great show. And I think that's it's legitimately great no matter what. Yes. Right. Agreed. But uh, but on that same note, though, like uh, when I was sort of like at one of my darkest periods where I was just like I was just like really fed up with things and I was really stressed out about like the move and the pandemic and the world and everything. Uh, Christy was like uh, my wife, Christy, was like, um you know, why don't we try watching Grey's Anatomy? I think you'd really like it. And that, and that was a show I'd always been like, I don't know, come on, Grey's Anatomy, you know? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and it is one of those things where it's like, yeah, like what you exactly what you're talking about, you know, it, when the world is right, when my mind is right, that is not a show I would watch because if it's like, yeah, it's too saccharine, it's too formulaic, whatever. But I have to say, I'm like super into it. We've, we've been plowing through. We're like, we, we plowed through like eight seasons of it in, and this is like, this is like beefy network seasons, like 24 episodes or whatever. Um, and we're just like plowing through it. And, um, I start calling it. That's a it, commitment. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started calling it Pretty Doctor Problems, and uh, <laughs> yeah. like, that's that's what the show is. It's uh, you know, and it's like I don't know. It's like uh, it's kind of nice, uh, you know. But um, yeah. Anyway, I, I totally hear what you're saying, though. That's uh... okay. So before we run out of time, I've, I really want to mention Adam Troy Castro's story. It's called Sacred's Pod. And I'm going to kind of, there's no way I can talk about this story without spoiling it. So I'm just going to spoil it. So if you don't want spoilers, I guess stop listening now or like wait until you've read the story or whatever. <laughs> but the the premise of the story is that there's a, a teenage girl and her, and this is, you know, in, in a futuristic science fiction outer space kind of setting, but there's yeah, this, this far, teenage, far future. Yeah. 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 And, and there's this, um, but there's this teenage girl and her religious parents have um, sort of paid these AIs to keep her confined in this. Um, sort of coffin shaped virtual reality environment. So she can't do anything sinful. And as the story develops, it turns out she, there's, there's like virtually no limit to what she can do. Um, you know, the virtual reality environment can create anything. She can create like a, a robot, um, you know, surrogate that can go out into the universe and do anything she wants. Like, and, and it has all the same sensory inputs and everything as if she were, were really doing it. And it turns out this is all sort of part of an experiment that the AIs are doing because they the, like one aspect of human nature that they still just haven't been able to wrap their heads around is why would anyone want to get out of the coffin if it makes no difference in terms of like anything you can do or experience. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting idea. And it was kind of making me think of, I don't know if you, you guys probably saw the, um, the Bruce Willis movie surrogates, which kind of deals with a similar idea, but um but I was kind of like, I mean, I, but I feel like I would be perfectly happy in the coffin, to be honest. <laughs> like, like that actually seems like an ideal situation to me. But maybe I'm mm -hmm. just weird like that. But I would just be curious what people think about that. Do you feel like... Have you um, ever seen that? Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, no, the, no, good, it, good. The Office dropped a few uh, unseen clips before. And one of them is uh, convincing... Um, oh, uh, what's his name? The, the goofy guy that keeps getting tricks played on him. Dwight. Uh, Dwight. Dwight Schrute. That's it. So uh, one of them is that they set up this very elaborate scheme to convince Dwight Schrute that he was in the Matrix, right? <laughs> and they even have like uh, this person show up who's going to give him the red pill or the blue pill. And uh, he chooses the one that keeps him inside of virtual reality because <laughs> he's like, I've got a pretty good thing going on here. I just got like a girlfriend or a fiance or whatever. Uh, I got a promotion at work. I'm doing really well. The farm's doing really well. Like things are great. <laughs> Yeah. So, so would anyone, I mean, that's different from like, cause I, I can understand why you would want to take the red pill if you, like, you know, there's bad things going on outside the simulation mm -hmm. and you could do something about it, but that's not even the case in this story. It's like, you can do anything outside yeah. the simulation that you could do, uh, that you could do if you escape from the coffin. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference? You know, why do you need to mm -hmm. go back and free your biological right. body and let it out? Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know that I, I don't know that I would leave the pod. Um, but uh, yeah, that that's a that's another story that I just really really love, um, and that this is another one that was originally in Lightspeed, um, and actually th this is a good excuse to sort of uh, to also mention uh, that uh, Best American Science Fiction Fantasy 2020 is actually also available as an audiobook. Um, I think this is the first volume that we released as an audiobook, um, and uh, as we were prepping for this panel and I was rereading some of these stories, I was listening to the audiobook version, and Secrets Pod, uh, that's an amazing story to listen to uh, on audio. Um, I mean, actually, you can also listen to the audio version on Lightspeed, but um, uh, this is a different audio version. I and uh, but yeah, it's just really great because like the the narrator, it's all, it's largely first person from the point of view of the of the um, AI, and so he's kind of doing this sort of uh, slight AI voice that's like really fun. Um, but then there's also these journal entries from Sacred uh, herself. Uh, and so they have a different narrator doing that voice and everything. And it's just, it's really great. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just, I just love Adam Troy Castro too. So, uh, I always love to, uh, see him show up in one of these. Uh, Bear, any thoughts on pod versus not pod? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would probably be in the pod. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I have been for the last <laughs> 12 months anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> it'd be it'd be nice to have a tour bot you know <laughs> to go out and visit places um the uh i i do think it's really interesting how this particular person 
Sacred, the, the protagonist, um, is motivated like to have these physical experiences in her own physical body. The fact that Sacred has this drive, um, and it turns out that like the, the drive is also kind of a, a vengeance, I'll show you, I'm not, like, that makes sense to me. Um, as a, like, I will not be, you know, I will not be beaten by my bullshit parents. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and that, the, yeah, so, so, so that, like, that kind of ties the story up in a nice little bow for me of, like, because the, the, the main question throughout the story is why is this character having these feelings? Um, you know, the, like, we're with the AI. Why wouldn't you just stay in your pod and have the richest life anyone could possibly imagine? Why would you want to, you know, we we all, it, it, I say we all, but at least everyone I know jokes about the day when they can retire the meat puppet and all it takes <laughs> and pains and, you know, get a nice titanium steel robot body. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think one of the interesting things that happens at the end of the story, too, is that, like, as it becomes clear that the AI can actually create a basically perfect replication of of uh sacred's body uh that no one else would be able to tell the difference of i mean specifically says that uh i was like huh that's like kind of like one of those like matrix moments where it's like well uh, are we all actually in one of those pods right now and it just <laughs> has recreated this uh thing you know whatever um but uh more to the point i was thinking like somebody who has like this really uh incredible like physical body like somebody like the rock or something who's like this finely tuned like you know, uh, human machine, uh, where it's like, you, you know, him reading that story might be like, huh? Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm super strong. I can do things that most people can't do. Like this makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is all tracking, you know? So <laughs> I, I kind of wonder if somebody who's like, who has like that sort of, uh, ideal physical body compared to like somebody like, you know, uh, I don't want to speak for the rest of you, but me, uh, you know, who does not, <laughs> uh, if we, if we sort of, if we sort of read those stories differently. Hmm. Okay, so I have one other uh, thing I really want to ask Bear. So in um, Dana Gabaldon's intro, she says, I'd have to say that 21st century speculative fiction expresses a lot more personal anxiety than did older stories from the mid to latest, mid to latest 20th century. And that kind of made me think of your story, um, Erase, 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 which I feel like deals with the internal state of the character much more than a science fiction story, you know, written in the pretty much any time, but, but, you know, of decades prior <laughs> would have, I was just wondering if you, um, what you think about that? I mean, I, I think that there have always been stories that are deeply focused on the, the internal life of the character. Um, I think that socially there was a lot of pressure to like there, there was there was a lot of market pressure to write a particular kind of story in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. Um, you know, the sort of man alone go off and conquer the universe story, uh, or the the here is an engineering problem story, or here is a neat alien race. Let's talk about the various details of their physiology, which has always been one of my favorite subgenres of science fiction. But I think of like. Um, uh, the Left Hand of Darkness, where there is an external narrative, but most of the most of what drives the story is the character's internal arc, um, an internal philosophical argument with himself. So I, I don't know if it's I don't know if there 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 may be more of them because there are, there's a greater diversity of markets right now than there has been in ages. Because there are so many, you know, online markets and um, the print magazines that are still in existence. And I, I remember, you know, 20 years ago when I was breaking into science fiction, we were all like, oh, God, how are we going to keep short fiction from dying? <laughs> um, well, now we have the, the biggest novella market we've had since Ace Doubles were a thing, you know. <laughs> and, um, it turns out that 
you, you put good short fiction in front of people and they will read it. We just needed John Joseph Adams to come along and edit. We just needed anthology. John Joseph Adams. <laughs> Before we completely wrap up, can I, uh, I, I really wanted to talk about the Victor Laval story, if, if just briefly. Do we have time yeah, yeah. for that? Uh, just briefly, okay. but yeah, for sure. Okay, so I this story absolutely blew my socks off. Um, and I, I think it's, it's a brilliant piece of, of, speaking of introspection, because this is a story that is almost entirely introspection. Um, but it's also, uh, one of the things I loved about it is that it is so obviously in the same family of, of Lovecraft responses as my own story, Shoggoths in Bloom. And I, I think that Victor did exactly the same thing I was trying to do in that story and probably did it better. Um, and I, I would just like like to recommend that story to just yeah. about anybody anybody who likes my work anyway mm. yeah that that's a fantastic story and and has absolutely like i'm not gonna spoil it but a absolutely like just devastating like last couple of paragraphs so it's, oh it's so good yeah <laughs> yeah well it's a killer story yeah and i would definitely also recommend reading victor's um author's note where he talks about like his feelings about lovecraft and what it meant to him to have a story like this in Weird Tales magazine and, and all the history of that. Um, I think mm -hmm. it's really, really worth uh, worth looking at. Um, but yeah, we are we are pretty much out of time. So um, let's just go around to get some final thoughts from everyone. So Toby, any uh, any fi final thoughts here at the end? Just a lot of fantastic stories. It's always just a total honor to be included in a collection like this. You know, the idea that like someone read it and a story of mine and went like, yeah, this is one of my favorite stories of the year always kind of uh, gives you this feeling of something. I don't know their pride accomplishment, but just uh honor to, to like, you know, have a piece in with all these other great pieces and get to read them and, and uh, marvel at who you're keeping company with. Mm. Uh, Bear final thought. The um, I, I thought overall, that this was an incredibly strong anthology. Uh, I had read several of these stories before. Um, every single one of them, when I reread them, I found new, new interesting things in. And it's just, yeah, as Toby said, great company to be in. I'm Toby's ditto head. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. <laughs> Better you, you know, than there's another a... guy, right? <laughs> There's a there's an aspect though, uh, Bear, of just being like, wow, we we broke in 20 years ago, and and now we're the people in the anthology that's like the year's best talking about the stories in it. It's mm -hmm. kind of mind blowing, isn't it? Because you and I broke in at almost exactly the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, God. Yeah, yeah it's we're old it's, now. <laughs> yeah, I I I. I I wouldn't even want to think of how much of my short story career is uh, owed to John Joseph Adams, but it's a hmm. pretty significant chunk of it. Oh gosh, me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, well, so, so John, final thoughts on this whole uh, yeah. best American thing. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I'm continuing loving uh, doing this every year and I, I'm glad that uh, there's been generally good uh, responses to it. And it's always nice to hear, like uh, when we do a panel like this, when when everybody else like uh, enjoys a lot of the stories as well, um, I'll just say like we talked about a bunch of the different types of stories that were in this book. But just for uh, uh, showing the other side of the spectrum, uh, there is a story in here called Shape Up Shape Ups at Delilah's uh, by Ryan Ryan Amel Emilcar Scott that is literally about like a town that's uh, affected by a curse. Uh, or, or, uh, there's a curse that uh, causes bad haircuts and there's a woman who has a magical talent for giving good haircuts. And so it's like, you know, it's not all, it's not all dreary and, and deep and sad. It's like, uh, you know, sometimes there's stories like that. And actually that story was in the New Yorker. So <laughs> that's another uh, sort of uh, left field uh, sort of element to that story. Uh, so yeah, anyway, it covers a lot of ground. There's this difficulty, which is like when you, when you when you ring up an author and you're like, you know, what got you into writing this story is that we're going to delve into all of the... <laughs> the serious, grave, deep thoughts that we had while writing it, which sounds makes all fiction sound like we're 
you know, right, giving you term papers. But uh, the truth is, like, as masterful writers, we should be able to uh, turn out something that, uh, you know, it, you are entertained by at the same time left with thoughts about. So, I mean, all of these stories are gripping. They're not, you know, like I said, term papers. And I always feel <laughs> bad about that when someone's like, what made you write my story's satire, right? It's uh, your uh, people enjoy it. They laugh. They're uh, amused by it, and then they go, "Hmm, <laughs> what would ex you know intergalactic tourism look like, and what does that mean about tourism today?" But uh, it's done as satire, and satire is poking at those big ideas with a, you know, with a grin. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's that that I I always feel a bit like uh, panicked when people are like, "So tell us about this," you know, the stuff that made you write, write this story, you know, and it's just like, "Oh, I was really upset about like, you know." uh inequality so i wrote this story about like jack and the beanstalk right you know and it's like <laughs> <laughs> like to a certain extent like the reader experience should be like nothing at all like what we were talking about what made us want to write the story <laughs> all right so we are all out of time so we're gonna have to wrap things up there but i hope that the uh that this conversation has given people a sense of yeah just the 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 breadth of subject matter and um you know the intellectual depth of of some of these stories and there's so many stories in this book that we haven't even mentioned you know there's 20 stories we can't talk about them all but you can read them all if you go out <laughs> and you know pick up this book uh, and again it's called the best american science fiction and fantasy 2020 uh edited by john joseph adams and diana gabaldone and so i want to thank all our guests today john joseph adams tobias s Bakel, and elizabeth bear so thanks, everyone, so much for joining us. Always good to be here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to John Joseph Adams, Tobias S. Bakel, and to Elizabeth Bear for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution... You can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkertley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.